Uh, do you know why why they left Mexico? Just for a better life, to make things better. Um, you know, they both lived like, well, back then everything was, you know, they were pretty poor and just little huts made out of paper and cardboard and, you know, whatnot. And so, yeah, my mom's uh, nine, eight brothers and her came over and it was just my dad at that, that time and one sister. So, yeah, just for better life. Yeah. Obviously, to make a better life for themselves. Yes, that's what it was all about. And boy, they can make their lives for themselves. With all these children, they kind of sort of, you know. But it was good. But it was very difficult for them at the time of the Depression. I think a lot of people from that area in Jalisco, which where my grandfather was born, were migrating here. And I think because of the colleges, they, there was more work here in this area. Yeah, that's, that's what the body looked like at that time. Everybody just made little shacks and little whatever so you could survive on whatever was around. Yeah. They made do with every little stick and cranny they find. It was, like I tell you, a hard life. But um, I do still remember when we first moved into that house. There was not a house. There was one room. But we, we landed there because my grandmother, my mother's mother, uh, decided she didn't want her family to be renting here and there. And somebody told her about this property there. And um, my grandmother bought that property for all of $200. And um, it just had the one room, like I tell you. And by that time, we were quite a handful of children already. But we all lived in the one room. And then my dad built like a, like a little carport. Mm -hmm. I just so remember that was our kitchen. And then he built an outhouse outside. And, and we ended up having to make cesspools when he finally did put in. Because he built his house room by room by room. It is three bedrooms, the kitchen two bathrooms with shower. He built it all himself. He did the electricity, he did the plumbing, he did everything, he did it all himself. Lock walls, all, he did it all. And it's still there, the house is still there. So it just, you know, grew and grew. As the family grew, the house grew. <laughs> I never thought that there was any white people, I always thought they were normal. I didn't think they were crazy. And then I realized later that they're just as crazy as we are, you know, except they're white and they don't get, the, the law is different, you know, especially in Claremont, so, yeah. you know, you weren't on the, allowed to own land until they built that, that section in, so 1950s, early 50s, and that's when they, they allowed Claremont people to, but there's like houses in the village with grant deeds to specify no selling to to Mexicans in the, the village, so and it just it just it, it, it was just different, you know. You know, white people had nice houses. We lived in little shacks, you know. They were concrete houses with a, a bathroom, a kitchen, a living room, and two bedrooms. Yeah, and that was it. I mean, it was open fields, nothing but where those apartments are over here, uh, east of. Uh, the barrio, there was nothing but like a swamp, yeah. trees, nothing there, mm -hmm. you know, nothing. And, um, you know, we used to go also down there and hunt for rabbits or whatever. But it's surprising how even the foothills, if you, today's foothills versus in the late 50s, I mean, I mean, everything changes. I, I know that, but man, what a difference the way it was back then versus what it's like now. You drive up that way and all you saw was grow after grow after grow. But growing up there, what strikes me mostly is what we call the brush, which is where Claremont Boulevard is now. Uh, very rural. Um, um, we had, there was two big, we called the big hole, which was about maybe uh, 
almost a mile wide and a half mile, but it was huge and we would play in there. But the bru we called it the brush. So when I think about that, we, we'd go spend all day out there during the summertime, just playing, making forts, digging holes, uh, finding uh, bushes that had long spears and we would have little spear fights. It was just so, it was so much fun. In the meantime, while we were there in Claremont, we all had a hard time. Everybody in the water had a hard time with their, with their lives, but as a child, you don't realize that they're having a hard time. You just live the day, you know? And it was a happy one, very happy one. Everybody there in the water was one big happy family, believe me. You'd go from house to house and, oh, another one? Would you like to eat? Are you hungry? That was the reaction of whatever house you walked in. And my dad would say, the enchanted burial, you know, you guys love that enchanted burial we were. I mean, it was our home, you know, and when we moved, like I say, we used to walk from over there. It was like how many miles, about how many miles to walk from? From Holt, pretty much from Holt all yeah, the way up here. To, to three uh, miles, something like that. Yeah. But we, we would, would walk it. Walk. Just to be up here. Yeah. And it was a very nice little barrio that we lived in, you know, like I say, we had the church, we had the little stores, you know, and as growing up, you know, of course, uh, Marilyn Novo, you know, she started organizing these mm -hmm. parties for us and uh, like he says, uh, tutoring after school and that, you know, so we, from little, we kept growing up and then, you know, everybody went their own way, you know, but it was a very nice growing up here in the barrio, you know, it was very quiet. We didn't... It was, it was almost like a painting place, a community. That uh, every, that, everybody uh, knew its everybody. Own. Everybody knew everybody. A lot of them were family, uh, but it was very, I don't want to say private, but it was just within that community that that we all just kind of knew each other, did our thing, uh, whatever happened in Upland or whatever, you know, it, it's another world to us. Yeah, well, we loved our barrio, you know, like I said, it was very uh, safe. Good. It was very safe, you know, and, and uh, when we moved, you know, we moved more into Montclair. We used to be Claremont, and then all of a sudden they changed the zoning to Montclair, okay. but we used to be Claremont, you know, and the other side was uh, uh, Claremont, and then one part was Upland, mm -hmm. you know, but we, we were like the last street in Montclair. Okay. You know, so of course we had to go to Montclair High School and that, you know, and uh, we had a lot of uh, uh, good memories, you know, and when we moved from our barrio, we moved more into Montclair and both Bobby and I didn't like it, you know, because, you know, we were raised here, you know. Because Claremont did not want any Hispanic and they did not want any black people in their school districts at all, at all. They didn't want any. That's why they sent us wherever. But going to school, um, a few years back, I had um, my high school reunion, and it was here held here in Claremont. And somebody would say to me, "Hey, Keto, we were we were just talking about you." And they said, um, "Didn't you go to Oakmont?" I said, "You know, I did." Well, you went to Vista. I said, I did go to Vista for a little bit. But you went to Condit. What about, but you're a sycamore. And I said, yeah. And I started chuckling and going, you know, I was being bust and didn't even know it. They were real nice, but yeah. my biggest thing was when Sister Benedict caught me in the hallway. I mean, I was just walking to the office and she caught me and kind of threw me into the, the boys' restroom because I was wearing, back then you wore flat tops. Mm -hmm. And she told me to get that hair down in the front <laughs> of my forehead. And she threw me in there and I was in there crying with hot water trying to bring my hair down. <laughs> Used to call us greasers, beaners, taco benders, you know. And these are people that I went to elementary school with. We went to Sycamore Elementary School, we all went. Mm -hmm. And that's when we ended up in the the house behind the school for a, for a couple of weeks before we were let into the into the main school. 
you know, but I wasn't really welcome. So the only kid that would play with me was, uh, he had a heart condition. Mm -hmm. and no, he couldn't play, so he would play with me. So. But it was just trains. Yeah. They weren't friendly. Just, it wasn't the way things should have been. And also it was the same way in public schools. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any problems, but my youngest brother, who is darker like my mom, they have more of the Indian, mm -hmm. Indian in them, did along with my cousin, and he was dark also, when they were in elementary school, they would, you know, do a couple of words in Spanish back and forth, and the teacher would get mad, mm -hmm. and she would come and smack them on their wrists with a ruler and tell them to get in the closet, and that this, yeah, that the there was only, only English spoken in class. I think most of the Mexicans in school that were in my class were okay with feeling all right with, because I know one of the girls became cheerleaders on them and everything, and you have to be pretty popular at yeah. that time. The other one, not so much. We blended in, but we blended in because we made ourselves blend in and yeah. you know everybody else was fine with it. What language did you speak in the, uh, at your house growing up? Always English. Yeah. And that was instilled in us by my parents. They wanted us to be able to assimilate. Yeah. And they said, we want to hear nothing but English here because we want you to be able to speak English. Which when I got older, I was a little bit bothered by that because there's so much Spanish out yeah. there now that I wish I would have, they would have said, just do both. Yeah. Broken Spanish mm -hmm. because it was, my mom was mad. She speak Spanish as he was in English, but. Yeah. When the, the the teachers came and told them no more Spanish at home, the second half of my family under, understands it but doesn't speak it. You know, it, it really was. It was to assimilate. My father would always, like I said previously, that my father is always geared towards education. I remember he handed me a book of, of poems and said, remember these. And... Um, he was, and my dad. My dad was always reading. My mom was always. We knew that we had a. We had to climb the ladder, and we knew we had to assimilate, to um, to progress in our lives. We had nine kids. Graduation cost. You, know, you get a, a yearbook. You have. A, you rent stuff. You go someplace. You, rent, you know. You have like a cap and gown and. You, you run everything, and he goes, my family didn't have money, and it didn't make any sense why, if I was going to, back then, the only place I was going to work was a packing house, why, why, uh, why take the time to graduate? I really enjoyed school, but came a time that I needed to help my mother, and I stayed home, you know. No, I stayed home. I worked. I tell you, I started working at the packing house. First doing housework, then do, and going to the packing house. After I started having my children, and I could not, I could not leave them here, there, and everywhere. It was just not in my heart to leave them with babysitters. I did start working again housework, so I could keep them with me, take them with me, pick them up from school. You know, it's it's difficult when you are a mother and you don't want to leave your children. With anybody, you know, yeah. So that's what it was all about for me then. That we had uh, seven siblings, siblings mm -hmm. you know, and um, both my parents uh, worked very hard to, you know, help out with a family. My, my dad uh, held down two jobs for better than 30 years. He worked at Kaiser Steel for 40 maybe, 40 years? I think it was 35 years. Yeah, and then he also uh, used to deliver the LA Times here in Claremont, and I helped him a lot with that, but uh, he, he did those two jobs for a good part of his. his he did his, sm smudging too. Smudging the too, and lemon the, the, the lemon grows when he used to get at that freezing temperature. They used to go out there and light those big old- uh, Torch? Incinerators, or what do you call yeah. them, to warm the groves up, on a, you know, things like that. And my mom did 40 years at the packing house here in Claremont. So uh, they both worked a lot. Very hard. And support hard seven keep. kids at the same time. We worked the fields. Our parents were just like, guys, you get a job, it's a city. 
that was a big time. That was, uh, you you made it. You don't have to work that hard. You don't have to work in the fields. I mean, that's the way the people saw the packing house. Because you got to work inside the packing house. But when you weren't in the fields. That was better. But they still treated you like dirt. And then my mom and her accident at the packing house, you know, like I say, she was a sample grader and there was a conveyor belt, you know. And I guess sometimes they got stuck or something. And my mom, well, she knew how to do it, but I guess that time it, she would wear rubber gloves mm -hmm. and it got her glove and she was trying to pull it, but it, the conveyor belt took her, her hand and it smashed her thumb. And I started crying, I says, Please, I need the job more so now than ever. Do not fire me, please. Do I not do my work? He says, that's it. You're such a damn good worker. I have to think twice. But you know they can close me down because of you. I said, why? I didn't understand the fact that I was a miner working. I didn't understand. I was a worker and I worked hard. And he knew it. So he said, you always have to have the last word. Get out of here and go to work. I said, okay. Because he felt sorry that now I'm married and he knows I need the, I need the job, I need the money. So he didn't fire me. But oh my God, he was so mad. Because I had been working there as a minor mm -hmm. without a written permit from the school or from the work, I mean, from my mom. I just got a job. I was happy that I had a job. So how old were you when you started working? I must have been not quite 15, 14, I guess. So that's why he was so mad. I was only 17 at that time. Yeah. So he did get very upset, but he said, that's just it. You're such a damn good worker. I can't get rid of you. So mm -hmm. he didn't get rid of me when I was working there at the back. It's just funny now, you know, they they want to talk about the what they did to the Hispanics. He goes like, and go to all oh, the packing house. It's such a great place. There's art galleries and little things like that. Because it was a, it was shit to work <laughs>
uh, Mario Cerno's little market in Claremont, and they opened that market because the markets that they had to go to in downtown Claremont sometimes they just didn't feel that comfortable going to them. Just coming into the downtown area was difficult. I remember my mom talking about, you know, walking to the store when she before she had us and they lived here. Mm -hmm. She said she would walk down First Street, which, you know, took them straight across into the town. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, people would look at her a little differently, but she had just made up her mind. It was, mm -hmm. you know, she had to do what she had to do to pick up things for her mom. So she would just get the items and then get right back home. Yeah. I even caught a little bit of that when I was in the service. Oh, you did? The, the, the tensions of being Hispanic. Uh, I remember me and my friend, uh, he was from Indio. We both went in together. Mm -hmm. And we were talking in Spanish. And the drill sergeant came up to us and grabbed us and he told us, I don't want to hear you two speaking like that anymore in here. And da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm, I'm sitting there saying, dang, we're in the military and they're still telling us we can't talk our native tongue. And when I got drafted, I was 19 and three months. You couldn't even vote till you were 21. But they've had protests here and they were all college kids and they didn't want to be drafted. Or some of them went to Canada, so. But. They had they protested and made a big deal out of Hispanics went because you got called, and Hispanics don't run. The Mexicans take pride in, in fighting for the country. Mm -hmm. They took they took you know and there's World War Two and World War One. I think there was if I remember right there was Mexicans that fought in the Civil War, but it's it's a totally different attitude towards being patriotic and doing what you're saying. And, and even after, you know, we would get uh, information from, uh, they would ask, like, leave pamphlets around, say, why are you fighting for, for the United States against the Viet Cong mm -hmm. when you're not, you don't even have equal rights there? Mm -hmm. Why are you fighting for democracy when you don't have it? And it's just totally different. I still have a lot of bitterness. Mm -hmm. I have PTSD. Uh, it took me 40 years to get them to acknowledge my hearing loss. And I finally got them to acknowledge my hearing when, oh, God, I was almost 50 probably. So, yeah, but what I've seen and what I've done still upsets me. And people say, oh, you were a soldier. I go, what we did to people. You know, just because somebody told you to. Those are really dark times. I remember at the time because in the you could watch literally watch on television news body bags of, of people. They showed that back then, and then having my brothers there, I just remember it being a dark time. And then, of course, it affected everybody. So I remember mom telling me during World War II, she said, "Mija, I just felt like there was a curtain put over me, and I had to wait over a year for your father to come home, and never knowing if he was going to come." And then all the things that the women had to do during that time. A lot of my aunts went to work, but um, like Rosie the Riveter type things, you know, factories. And uh, so it, it affected that dynamic. But as soon as that war was over, they had to go back to being housewives. Like I say, we made it fun, you know. Everybody would get out of work, take your showers, and we put something on the stove and we'd get together and we would go to San Dimas, what is called now Raging Waters. They didn't have any of that. They just had what they used to call a beach area. And we would gather our kids and we would go down there and have the kids play in the water. And we would all put whatever we cooked that day on the, on the table, made it like a picnic, a little of yours and a little of mine, and it made it like a like a little buffet, mm -hmm. and we all had a wonderful time. The guys would relax, you know, with the kids in the water and have a good time. That was our swimming pools, and then we'd come home tired and go off to work the next day. During the summer, it was fun. So, simple but fun for our families. Mm -hmm. uh, we had parties in our little tiny house, and had people over, had friends there, had Halloween parties, things like that. So we did have a good time there, and, and lots of food, wonderful food. Ah, 
I really learned to like Mexican food. My husband was a good cook also. And fortunately, he liked to cook. And uh, his family made the tacos for the fiesta that the church had every year. They did that, for, his parents did that for 40 years. And then he took over, and his brother. And they were still the best tacos I've ever known. And they made their own salsa from scratch, roasting the chilies and everything. It was very, very good. And Rosa Torres lived next door. And she was pretty well known in the barrio. And she would make the tacos for the uh, 4th of July at the park. So she was very nice too. In my mom and dad's days there were the years that they built a chapel. And it was most of the residents from the little barrio that got together and, and mm -hmm. did, I mean, they did the whole thing by hand. They built it by hand. I think my mom said my dad helped a couple of times with different things, but it was just a, it was a co collective thing where different people just got in there and did what they could. The Mexican men started a baseball team called the ACs, mm -hmm. and they didn't have any uniforms. And so my mom had the idea of having fiestas or having a booth and selling tacos to make money to buy the uniforms. So that's how that started. And so my mom, for years and years, still did the taco booths along with my aunts until everyone started moving away or passing away. Mm -hmm. They did that for years over at OLA, and then eventually they got older. It was too hard. So yeah. usually the Gonzalez's, Gonzalez brothers took over and did that afterwards. Mrs. Galt was a, a nurse that used to come into the body. It was a, a intercultural council, I think it was. My mom was pretty active with her and that. And they would have the well baby clinics where people would bring their children to their home to have, you know, have checked out. And um, Marilyn Noble, she was also, I remember her as a, a child. She was pretty active in the barrio. She always checked. We used to think she was a social worker because, <laughs> I mean, she would just walk into your house and <laughs> before you knew it, she was sitting down for dinner. But she was very active bring people together in the barrio. I'd say from the, uh, the workshops that we had, that Marilyn put together, mm -hmm. we also had the, uh, the team posts. Yeah. And team posts were, uh, again, it's one of those things that you had team posts here, you had, uh, it seems like they were all over. Uh, it was a, like a youth center. You could go in there and uh, they had TV, you could do homework in there if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. Uh, play pool, pool table, pool table play uh -huh. records, music. And I remember um, Ray Contreras, who used to be the director. Oh yeah, of the Ray. Post, yeah. Uh, he used to uh, set up uh, uh, like dances with uh, other cities like Baldwin Park, Azusa. So we, used, we, you know, we used to go down there, and it, and it was kind of odd, I guess, because we would show up, and it's at their team post, and it's almost like you walk in and you're standing in one corner, and the people from that particular team post are are standing at the other because you don't know anybody, but. After a while, you start talking, and the music starts playing, and it turns out to be a very a, nice, a very nice social gathering with another community outside of your own. So th those were fun memories yeah. too. Yeah. They all tried to keep up the boys like out of trouble, you know, mm -hmm. like my brother-in-law Ben Molina, you know, uh, Ray Contreras, you know, Marilyn, you know, they did all these little things to try to keep us, you know. We check. My father also didn't want us, he kept my brothers involved in sports. That was his thing because back then there was a culture, what we called pachucos back then. I think now they call them cholos, but they were pachucos back then. And on Huntington Drive there, they used to hang out. And my brothers are pretty much forbidden to go down there because my father did not want them involved in any, and the same thing with me. I wasn't able to be involved. So to him, that represented that, that culture. So we weren't really allowed to participate too much. Uh, we had a park that we were called Neighbors Park because we really didn't have a park. Not like the rest of Claremont where Memorial Park had a grassy area, baseball field, Condit had the same thing. So we were called Neighbors Park. And so growing up, that would be elementary time. So um, as we got older, we, would, we had a, uh, a person who was employed, I think, by the city of Claremont, Ray Contreras. And uh, he had a pickup. And so we would play baseball, football, basketball, and we had nowhere to practice. And our field was just a dirt field, and that's all we had. But it was fun. We would compete with the neighboring parks in Claremont. Now the park is called El Vario Park. 
for my mother growing up, Chicano was, was a bad terminology. She didn't like that at all. She didn't want me to refer to myself as uh, that. And La Raza was considered you know, derogatory. So I had that kind of dynamic going on where my generation was interested in becoming Chicanos and, and uh, you know, pursuing different things. But my mom didn't really, they, they frowned upon that. The older generation frowned upon that. But um, so when they built the Barrio Park, she was highly insulted that they called it Barrio because it was like, like ghetto or type thing, you know, saying that same type of word. But I think pretty much that whole generation didn't, didn't look well on that because we knew that as the Chaparral and that was kind of our playground. Everybody played there when we were kids. So they were taking that away from culturally from us and putting the park there. But that was later, the park came later. They had a procession from Sacred Heart, the church they tore down, and they walked all the way down on First Street to Berkeley, where they have Our Lady of the Assumption. I've always yes. disagreed with the street, Claremont Boulevard, because it, it, it's always been me that, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but why did it have to go right smack down the middle mm -hmm. of the barrio? Why did it have to knock down the church, the pool hall, the store, basically mm -hmm. closed? And and I always question that. Why? Why down the middle? Why couldn't they put it around, you know, and continue to save the, the barrio the way it was? They did it to wipe out the Mexican community. They got rid of the church, the pool hall. Yeah, I went to the pool hall more than the, the church, but... Yeah, they just wiped it out. Sometimes I, I feel like they never listen to us, you know, like because we're a Mexican community, you know, that they don't listen to us. Isn't that funny that they always find that what they really don't want around is what needs to come down. Like they didn't want the water around anymore. So that's exactly where the Claremont Boulevard had to run through mm -hmm. so they can tear down half of it. I think what they were trying to do also, because the Claremont Colleges owned a lot of that property, especially I think it was CMC at the time. And I think they wanted to use some of that property, but at the same time, I personally feel that that was just a ruse yeah. to divide everybody yeah. and have some people, which was already taking place actually. The division ha was some of the kids that were in the barrio went actually to some Montclair schools. Other ones went to Claremont schools. So they were already kind of breaking us up already. So I think it was just their way of like, let's keep them in their place type of attitude, but it didn't work. That's what I said, hmm, it seems like what they want, they take, and they don't have any regards of the people that live there, right? But oh well, I guess that's what life is all about. Get out of the way here, I'm coming. How did the racial dynamics in the city change over time? Have you, how have you seen them change? You know, I don't think they've really changed that much. Yeah. You don't see, I mean, well, especially now that the colleges have opened up downtown Claremont to make it more suitable for the students, families, yeah. and everything. You look now, and how many really Mexicans do you see in downtown Claremont? Yeah. There really aren't that many. To be honest with you, I think that it's still pretty much the same. They went underground. It, it still exists. I see it in this town, so uh, Claremont pretty much has always been that way. It, it was very liberal for a while, and uh, that, that changed a few things, but then it started to get a little more conservative again, so it's, I still see racial disparity in this, in this city. Once the colleges get a hold of all the land, it, it, it's done. So nobody's gonna know the Mexicans live there. No one's gonna know. How many people know that the, from, from Indian Hill all the way, you know, from Berkeley, mm -hmm. where the church is, all the way to Town Avenue was Orange Grove. All based on, from Foothill North was Orange Grove. And, and you go out to Guasti, Dukumanga, those were all uh, grapes, wineries. How, how many people don't know that? How many people actually know anything about where they live? Honestly, I felt like it was useless. Why? Are you going? Why are you 
spending your time and energy on trying to revive certain things. I just think within time, it's just going, they're going to evaporate. And my honest feeling was that, why? Why are you fighting this? It's going to, it's going to happen. And uh, so my thought for a long time was, was that.